Every other year, I, AWRT members produce a documentary on a special theme. And this year, we chose Women Making News. And the result is the film we are going to see now, uh, The Velvet Revolution. And I was speaking in a very Syrian dialect, and he was insisting. I showed him my Syrian ID, and he was like, this is a fake, you're a foreigner. Like, Why? He said, you can't be a Syrian and a journalist at the same time, and a woman. If this is a century of the media, then this decade has become one of the most difficult for the media. When I came on board as the executive producer, uh, I said, where do I begin this story? Where sh how shall we search, uh, go at this topic? Patriarchy, newsrooms. Uh, I moved beyond that and decided to look at where women are now uh, in this world, women journalists, how are they actually uh, navigating you know, uh, the global space as they do their work? You know, I always saw myself um, as a human rights advocate in some ways, although as a journalist you have to take a slightly, slightly a step back. And my decision to move from journalism um, which was really a surprise, I think, to many people, and it only happened last year. So I'm very, I'm, I'm a very new human rights advocate, if you like, in 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 this in that sort of formal sense. Um, but but the reason was several, and I think you know one of the big ones, of course, was the fact that I was a Middle East correspondent that could no longer get to report from the Middle East. I was I always was based in the last 15 years in the Middle East from. Damascus to Lebanon to the Gaza Strip and, and then the last five years from Egypt. But I, I found that increasingly the, the space was getting smaller. Um, I had to report from a, about Syria from Turkey. I had to report about Yemen from either Saudi Arabia, and that's when you were allowed into Saudi Arabia, or, or Dubai or somewhere remote like that. Um, and increasingly the, the places that we could actually travel to and go to, as men and women uh, journalists, I think, uh, became smaller. When I left Zimbabwe, it wasn't actually uh, because I was uh, fleeing the country, but I was um, going to study in the United Kingdom. So after my course, uh, the situation in Zimbabwe was deteriorating. Journalists were getting arrested. They were getting beaten up, and then about six of us decided to set up the country's first um, independent radio station broadcasting on shortwave. And so, um, because the government couldn't really touch us from <coughs> London, um, they decided to put us on a, a, a banned list. A um, uh, banned list also included members of the, the British government, and then on that list there were six Zimbabweans. Some opposition parliamentarians asked, um, you know, in, in, in Parliament in Zimbabwe, you know, how could you uh, ban your own uh, citizens from uh, from returning uh, to, to the country? And the Justice Minister at that time said that we were free to return uh, to Zimbabwe, but in the country's prisons. The Philippines is the ranked as the second most dangerous country for journalists by the International Federation of Journalists. So for the past 25 years, um, there have been 146 killings of journalists, and we have witnessed, I have witnessed that personally <laughs> throughout the years. Um, at least one of them was my personal colleague, um, a, a campus journalist who was um, writing on human rights violations in Cotabato, and she was um, shot by, by the military. And um, it continues under the current administration, and um, the, the only difference is that um, it's even more dangerous now because there's actually a climate of fear because of the things that he says. It's not just words because um, it happens. Like there are more, now more than 7,000 7, people, drug suspects killed. Journalists, um, instead of, well, we have many support actually, but um, some, some of them are being pilloried by, by, by the supporters of the president by saying that um, for, for reporting on the drug killings, um, they are being accused of being paid hacks. Um, they are accused of being irresponsible. And um, the women journalists in particular, they even get um, threats online. Um, particularly, and you know how it is when we are threatened online, we are threatened with many things, including harm to our families, including rape. What I'm struck by when I'm, when I'm listening to both your stories is just this, this incredible crackdown that we're seeing, um, not just on journalists, I think it, it's, it's on 
anyone that challenges the narrative of, of the state. Uh, and whether that's human rights advocates or lawyers or uh, journalists, you know, it, we're all somewhat in, in the same boat. Um, and I think that what's really stark is that we're sitting here discussing this in the United States, where we have a president that is doing a very similar thing. I mean, it's, it, we, there, there are laws here in place that stop the, that kind of, you know, extreme crackdown. Uh, but at the end, it's still, you know, we still have a government or administration in place in the U.S. that is, um, you know, really challenging any, any journalist that tries to um, create a different story or narrative as to what's going on now. The thing is, journalists are being killed every day. Now, 52 may sound like a small number to you in a year. It isn't. Because this is also, don't forget, the most protected group in a sense. So to be able to kill that powerhouse requires a lot of guts from the state and non-state players. One of the questions that I was asked in Delhi is that what do you want this film to do? And I said, I want solidarity among journalists to return. And the second is that ownership from civil society towards journalists, and particularly women journalists who are doing you know, an amazing amount of work. All these women are doing such amazing work, but quietly, without thumping and, you know, on their chest and saying, I'm the greatest. And I think that's so beautiful. you know. And each one of them, in turn, represents some 10,000 other women you know, who are there in all these countries working. So in a sense, we need ownership of the media again from civil society. Otherwise, how do we do our job?